The game of golf has been shaped by some legendary figures, players and pioneers whose brilliance often helped change the sport itself. Golfing World's resident coach, Simon Holmes, is looking back at the careers of some of these greats of the game. Today, he's turning his attention to one of golf's most distinctive figures, Australia's great white shark, Greg Norman. Greg Norman was born in Queensland, 1955. So that just make him a couple of years older than sort of his big rivals, his rivals to be Seve Ballesteros and Nick Faldo. And it was his mum, really, who got him into the game. That combined with Jack Nicklaus golf books. And you could easily see the influence of Jack Nicklaus's swing in the Greg Norman technique, you know, that big arm swing with very, very powerful uh, lower body drive. But Greg Norman would be an unbelievable driver of the ball, maybe one of the best drivers of the ball ever, and it would be the hallmarks of his game. Well, anyway, he improved very, very quickly. It only took him 18 months from starting the game to get to a scratch handicap, and he would turn professional very soon after. So his first sort of stint was an assistant pro in a golf club, but he would soon become a tournament professional and very much aligned in terms of the time with what Nick Falder was doing. Well, Greg Norman would have some success in Australia and he would come across to the European Tour and instantly won the Martini International. So he would put himself on the stage and it was the way in which he did it. I mean, he did things no one did. He won the French Open by 10 shots. So it was sort of combined with this sort of excellent figure, that blonde hair, big uh, teeth, amazing, powerful game combined with this sort of sublime chipping and putting, turned him into an absolute global superstar. So he wouldn't stay very long in Europe. He was straight off to the main stage playing in America in 1982, and he would go on to have huge, huge success. The move to America was incredibly positive for Greg Norman, and in the 1984 US Open, he holds this amazing putt to get into a playoff with Fuzzy Zeller, but unfortunately, it wouldn't be successful, and he would lose to Zeller in the Monday playoff. Now, 1986, he is absolutely the dominant force in golf. But if we look at those four major championships in 1986, we can start to get a feel of what was happening to Greg Norman in these uh, big superstar events. So in the Masters, he loses the lead to a charging Jack Nicklaus. Come to the US Open, he's got the lead at Shinnecock, but he loses by six shots, shooting 75 in the last round to Ray Floyd. The Open Championship at Turnbury on Friday in dire conditions, he shoots 63, only 15 oh. players broke par, oh. and he would go on to perform brilliantly and win that tournament by four shots. And in the last major of the year, the US PGA in Toledo, and what would happen, Norman would have again a four shot lead with nine holes to go, and Bob Tway improbably would hold this bunker shot on the 72nd hole to nick the tournament once again from Greg Norman's hands. And this frustration, this continual sort of second place, third place, just losing would continue to happen. Norman felt his game was to blame for this. His technique was to blame for this. And so he would go to Butch Harmon so that under pressure, he wouldn't hit so many loose shots. And if we think about some of the opportunities, these were all big swings. Norman never went for sort of like a three quarter shot to get the ball in play. He always, if it was between a seven and eight iron, he always went for the hard eight iron. And very often he would sort of lose the sequence, lose the shot to the right and under pressure, it was to be his undoing. Well, in 1993, Royal St. George's, the Open Championship. Nick Faldo, definitely the man to beat. Greg Norman is playing some super golf and he would shoot 64 in the last round to defeat Nick Faldo on his home territory and really put his stamp on that tournament. He would go on in the Players' Championship to shoot all of the tournament records and play brilliantly. So the whole work that Greg Norman did with Butch Harmon definitely tightened his swing and he finally took his second major championship. However, if we look at the Norman game, he has to be thinking every single April, how am I not at that champion's dinner? You would have thought that would be the one tournament 
that he would have been absolutely perfect for. But I think Norman had a lot of influences apart from his fantastic game. He was the first professional who really sort of started to diversify into other businesses. He was definitely very, very entrepreneurial. He was the first professional to arrive in his own helicopter. He had a boat. He had business interests that were in the golf business and lots of other areas to do with sort of food and wine and Australia. So he, for me, was one of the people who saw his position and was able to see all of the other opportunities, all of the other revenue streams. And I think that that created a much different model. You know, Greg Norman had the great white shark. Everywhere you went, you saw this logo, this branding. So he understood from his position as a global ambassador how to really leverage that into long-term business interests. And if you look at the modern players, Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy, all of these players are starting to see, starting to see early these other business opportunities. He really paved the way to show how golf professionals could become global business entrepreneurs.